Hello everybody, James here, WSI, my next guest, I was just saying to him beforehand, goodness me, he had a varied career, we've had so many questions in that this has got to be one of the most challenging script writes I've ever done, we've got six pages worth of your questions, my questions and everything else, he's taken over, Big Stevie Cool, hello. Hey James, how you doing man, thank uh, you for having me on. Oh, thank you for coming on, I noticed I just sort of uh, almost went into radio voice mode there slightly, that's something I don't often do. Oh, did you want to do the weather and the sports, and then I can come back? Mm, yeah, well, I can throw it to you. How's the how's the traffic, weather in traffic there? Traffic and weather. No sport. <laughs> I get it, guy. So, how are you keeping? Because I, I didn't ask you this beforehand. We've just been chatting beforehand, and I said, "Well, I'll I'll, I'll learn along with everyone else who uh, who's not seen the videos and been following your recoveries closely." as uh, uh, other people have, I suppose. Uh, how are you physically now? And what were the issues originally a few months ago when you... So it was a back infection, or was it a spine infection? Yeah, a spine infection. And I have to say, I, I say it every day when I wake up, before I'm even able to do things I wasn't able to do when this infection was really hitting me. And I'm just grateful to be alive, upright, be able to walk without the assistance of a walker and cane, which I keep just off camera here as a reminder that I should be thankful, grateful, blessed, all, all that stuff. But what basically happened was it wasn't an all of a sudden thing, but it came on the, the, the really bad part came on all of a sudden. So apparently I was, I, I was basically suffering from this infection for months. Little by little, I was either feeling very tired. I was run down. I was having back pain, but you interview a lot of pro wrestlers, a lot of legends in this business. Every single wrestler is going to have that lower back pain eventually we're all going to hit a wall and we're all going to have to deal with rehab surgery, all the above anything, or in Hogan's case, you know, repeatedly getting those, uh, those um, like input nodes to electroshock your back. Like every wrestler is going to have either a neck and or lower back injury. So for months I was just thinking, ah, oh, my back's starting to hit that wall. Maybe I'm going to need surgery. Maybe I'm going to need a nerve block, whatever, whatever fix I could have at this point to keep going. Uh, and then uh, in the end of January on a Sunday morning, had one of my best workouts ever thought I was pulling through like one of those bouts where your lower back keeps biting you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you sit down for a living, you're editing videos, you're podcasting, which you know exactly what that feels like. You're just thinking, well, maybe I'm just stiff because I'm sitting down too much and I got to do other things. But from 9 a.m. when I got home, and I thought, okay, that was a good workout to noon after podcasting and doing the SmackDown review with Ben and Ben Amin and then sitting here for some video editing, I was completely stuck in my chair. And it was just a mystery. Like my back has locked out, but not to the point where my legs are almost useless, not, not paralyzed, not numb, but it hurt so bad. I couldn't put pressure on my legs because it would shoot up into my back. So my wife literally from 9 a.m. when I got home and then at noon had me in a walker. I went right to a walker. I'm moving around. And it's just now fear. The early set of fear is settling in. Like, well, I've never experienced pain like this. You know, being debilitated, being in bed or having a walker where I can't even really use the walker after a little while. So fast forward two weeks later, many doctors, pain management clinics, spinal clinics, not finding anything, even two visits to a hospital emergency room because the pain was so bad. And even it got admitted for a day or two in the first hospital after about two weeks of not knowing what was going on. And is this going to be my life now? Because they didn't say I need surgery. They didn't see a uh, herniated disc in my spine or anything that was normal for a pro wrestler with 30 plus years. Um, we went to the Mayo Clinic and we were just begging them, please see, see, what I'm, what I'm like right now, because I went from a walker to right before the Mayo Clinic, needing a wheelchair at the hotel. Couldn't even, couldn't even use a walker because, because in those two weeks, James, I'm not eating right. I'm not sleeping at all. And all the, all my arm strength is used to use the walker, not my legs. So that's going to give out eventually. So I'm in a wheelchair and then Mayo Clinic finally got eyes on me. Thank God. Finally got eyes on me. And once they saw me, I got admitted. They started doing tests. They did a spine biopsy, which by the way, because of the infection, none of the twilight type of anesthesia worked. Mm -hmm. I felt every bit of them hammering a needle into my spot. Oh. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, I, I, 
I was just like laying there and he kept apologizing. And I just <laughs> hear that it sounded like a railroad spike going into my back. So was it, so, did we have like epidurals and the whole bit as well to numb the area or? No. And, and thankfully I'm glad they didn't, they didn't do a nerve block earlier in the pain management clinic or any of these other places because they quite frankly, they didn't know what they were looking for. And that's why the Mayo Clinic had an infectious disease person take a look at it and see from the CT scan in the previous hospital is seven days later in the Mayo Clinic, it went from being just a little hot spot, like a white spot, to literally eating away at half my L4 and L5 vertebrae, both of them. It was that fast moving once it hit my spine. So they put me on broad spectrum antibiotics like right away before they even knew what strain of infection it might be. They're like, this thing is moving so fast, we got to attack it. Meaning that they were afraid, not knowing, you, you can't predict the pattern or, or how, like it works so slow for seven, eight months, hits the spine. And then like in a week, two, maybe three weeks, it's just going to town on my vertebrae mm. and working its way up from L5 to L4, part of L3. So what they needed to do now is like, what do we got to do to keep this thing from going into his brain and then eating every level of vertebrae up into the brain? Can Very I, scary stuff, which they didn't tell me until after, after yeah. we were out in the woods. <laughs> so I was like, that's a good red. Can, can I ask, uh, do, do you know where the infection stemmed from? I mean, was this something that just sort of built up from within or was this something external that you somehow caught this infection? We were very, we're, we're still like being very careful about, but I own, you know, two garage gyms that we rent. We don't own them, but I have the garage gym business. And at first we were, we thought it might've been because I wasn't as attentive with the cleaning, like every home and garage gym owner, we're, we're never cleaning as well as a commercial gym. Uh, we thought it might've been that and I might've had an open cut or something because it kind of resembled the symptoms of staph infection or MRSA. If you get that and plenty of wrestlers have gotten that from Matt Byrne and, but I hadn't wrestled in a, at least two or three years full time. So I thought it might've been in the gym and it wasn't that what, it, what they believe it was, is that I was over at my best friend's house and his dogs got freaked out by something that happened. And I just happened to be petting one of the dogs. It bit me right in the face and like, like right through the skin to the other side. The other one got freaked out by the noise and then got freaked out because the dog got freaked out and bit me in the leg. It was a goofy thing. But, but the point of that was number one, I'm glad it didn't bite my wife. I'm glad it didn't bite the neighborhood kids that were over in the house either because it would have been a lot more traumatic to have that. I can at least grow the beard out and cover it somewhat. But not long after that, and see, when we went to the emergency room too, a lot of stuff has happened. So if I skip something, I'm no, sorry. No, no, please go. The, the, the emergency room, I they believe too that what might have happened is the emergency room sealed the wound up on my face too tightly because they said that sometimes with animal bites, you need to keep it open to some degree to keep the infection from being, from being sealed in. That's pure speculation. The other thing, if that wasn't enough, I got COVID like four days after that. Oh. So my, my, not so much the feeling or the sickness of the week of being, you know, having the COVID, but it was mostly, they feel like that may have knocked my immune system down enough to let the infection travel. That's kind of all that stuff put together was kind of, a recipe for something that still only happens to a very small percentage, thank God, of the population because osteomyelitis, which is the official uh, diagnosis, is probably one of the most painful things that I've, probably the most painful thing I've ever had to experience in my life. Uh, where are you exactly with your health now? Are you officially clearing out of the woods? What are you uh, doing in the gym? Uh, are you walking normally, running normally? What? Where are you now? Well, if you saw my running video, I, I can't quite run normally anyway. Your father, who you talked about, he's still running, is probably a lot better of a runner than <laughs> I am, even, even without the infection. I, I can just use that as an excuse. Oh, yeah, I have terrible form because of the infection. That's right. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's always going to be in the back of our mind and we're always going to have to get blood work at least for the foreseeable future to make sure that's how you tell if you have the infection, the blood work, if it's hitting the yellow or the red in certain blood markers, that's how they found it initially as well. Besides the CT scan, um, I'm officially out of the woods, but I also have to be very careful because 
the effects of the effects from the spine infection have still lowered my immunity. I'm down about 35 pounds still, which I wanted to lean out, but I didn't want to do it that way. <laughs> but, but I'm down from, I was down from 215 and I dropped to 180. Now I'm around 180, 185. But my workouts, I have to say, thank God, have been outside of hip hinging movements and putting any kind of pressure, axial pressure on my neck or my spine. I'm pretty much able to do just about everything. Now, what I've done, James, too, because I'm a, I'm, I'm really a fitness enthusiast and that's why I have my fitness brand. I started my fitness journey all over again. And I'm still technically, even after about two months, I'm cardio, like 90% isometrics, some suspension body weight training, and maybe a little bit of cable work. But isometrics have been the core thing to, number one, activate my muscles again because they were atrophy for so long to kind of start to heal the arthritis, which creeped up because every single injury I ever suffered, I know you talked about your ACL, you're going to have arthritis unless you keep working out, you keep moving, you keep active. So that those months of not being able to do anything, every bit of the arthritis came up. So the isometrics kind of start to strengthen my muscles and take the impact off my joints. And then of course, you know, overtraining cardio and stuff like that. <laughs> I, 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 like I'll say blessed, grateful, and thankful, all that stuff a million times, because there's no amount of times I could say it to, to express like even sitting here talking to you pain-free, it, it's never going to leave me how amazing that feels compared to what I was, I think like six, eight weeks ago, maybe even sooner. Do you, um, I'll just bring this up very quickly. As you said, cause I bore everyone to death with my ACL story. Uh, do you sort of get after I had the operation? In fact, after I did the injury, and then after I had the operation, and then you're a lot weaker, and you've well, my leg is atrophied, and then you have to work so hard to do the basic stuff again. Do you sort of see? Do you get like a silver lining sort of satisfaction of seeing such improvement over the course of just a few weeks when you start really building up and building up again? Because it's like I mean, you've been working out, I'm sure, for decades now. And the first six weeks, they say, when you start hitting the weights and everything, you see tons of improvement, and then everything everything else is, you know, smaller portions of improvement every single time. Well, I I think I go back to the isometrics too, because a lot of times when you work out, and then if you're in the same environment, the same gym, your home gym, garage gym, whatever it might be, you become comfortable and you start going through the motions. And basically, we're working out too, just like people. Isometrics is just flexing your muscles. Dynamic movements is when you're talking about up and down on curls or pressing or pulling or whatever it is. People tend to like kind of like just blow through the first eight, nine, 10 reps until they get tired and sore and it becomes difficult. Then they're working out properly. With isometrics, there's no cheating. There's no like just going through the motions. You literally have to squeeze time under tension, stuff like that. So I feel like this round of resetting my fitness journey has got me more gains because I'm never going to forget about the basics and the foundation because right now, as part of a natural fusion over the next year to 18 months, isometrics, water weights, body body movements, suspension training are going to have to be the mainstay of, of my fitness journey. <clears throat> oh, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. The mainstream of my fitness journey, uh, I have no choice. So I have no choice but to train properly now. And that's why it's it's actually very satisfying to see that. Um, but on the other end, I wouldn't be where I'm at. And this is something else I'll repeat without the support and encourage and the encouragement and the motivation of my wife, because this particular thing and any wrestler who's had both or any person who's had both an injury and an illness as an athlete or any kind of athlete or entertainer, injury has a blueprint on how you can recover your, your ACL as much as it'll suck, as long as it'll take, as frustrating as it'll be, you know exactly how long it'll it should take to recover if you do everything right. Yeah. With an infection like this, dude, there's still people that six months in, eight months in, still aren't walking, still aren't functioning, still aren't doing anything. Or a matter of fact, they're still getting worse. So I look at that and I go, wow, I'm so, you know, thankful for that. And then my wife telling me I can do it when the fear of the unknown saying, I don't, I never experienced this before. So how, how am I ever going to get better? And my wife says, shut up. You are going to get better. And that kind of 
tough love motivation. She was my Mickey to my Rocky movie type thing. <laughs> he slapped me, slapped me across the face, not literally, but telling me you, you need to just go and do this. You know, as Mickey said, just go do good. And you do good. I guess yeah. whatever he said. You, you go get him kid. That kind of thing. But he was like, Oh, he goes, you do good. And I'm going to be watching you do good. It was yeah. some, south philly thing that i grew up with where it doesn't make any sense <laughs> uh do you know I'll, I'll leave this in the main clip as well but uh please tell people your youtube channel your fitness regime where people can find all of that now hey as i'm about to plug my own stuff i almost destroyed my my, my microphone <laughs> you, you know you got really excited then when <laughs> i did i was like oh finally somebody's asking me about my <laughs> now, i have Stephen richards fitness and what i do is you know i basically try to help people through the youtube channel mostly with the videos the reviews the information to basically help them make the best consumer decision, the most informed consumer decision for a home, garage, gym, whatever gym space. And obviously from wrestling, wrestling was exciting when I did it because it was always changing. You can always reinvent yourself. We're going to talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. with my career. Uh, but in the fitness world too, it never gets boring. There's always a new workout, a new program. Then you get a deadly spine infection and you get to experience a whole new, whole new version <laughs> of your fitness journey after that. And that's, that was my mission statement before, but the infection actually taught me to be even more empathetic for people that are, that are limited right now at this point. And if somebody's back is really, really hurting and debilitating them, now I can have that empathy and know how they feel. So I have a broader understanding as a mm -hmm. businessman too, what to do. Um, and Steve Richards Fitness also has resistance band training programs Right now, they're just under 10 bucks. They've been under 10 bucks because I want everybody to have the most accessible, you know, affordable workout programs that they can have. And also, I support those programs personally. So I have a great passion uh, for helping and serving others. And I think later on, we'll talk about a new category that I'm kind of diving into. Hopefully, you can, you and Dutch maybe be a part of that because I, I, I would feel remiss not including Dutch, one of the greatest minds in the business. With, with the type of content that I'm planning on putting out there. We'll, uh, we'll bring that up in a bit, but I'll have all the links for everybody if you're interested in Stevie uh, Richard's fitness. I'll have it in the uh, this YouTube channel and uh, every video that we post. So uh, in description, uh, comments and that kind of thing. We are going to move on now, Stevie. And as I've said before, we received almost an upsetting amount of questions that I've spent the last two and a half hours sorting through to pick the best ones. And the first one is one that isn't a question from a fan, it's from me. Uh, training with Iron Mike Sharp. Now, Iron Mike is one of the more popular subjects we get on WSI. And why did you pick Mike? Was he the most local guy? Well, I, I originally, if you back up before that, I, was, I, I wasn't I was trained to a point where I knew what I was doing, but I was trained originally at Tri-State Wrestling Alliance's school. Uh -huh. So this was ECW before ECW. This was ECW before it was the Eastern Championship Wrestling. This is Joel, so this was Joel Goodhart days, wasn't it? Joel Goodhart, yes. You know, Larry, Larry Winters, DC Drake, the rich, the Sandman as a surfer. That's why they <laughs> called him the Sandman back in the day. One of your favorite interviews. Um, <laughs> we're gonna give people little sneak peeks into the pre uh, the the you know the pre interview conversation. <laughs> so uh JT Smith. Jimmy Gennetti, uh, and then a host of people used to come through, including Buddy Rogers, I think, came to school one time because he had a match, I believe, against Buddy Landell. They booked one at the at whatever hall. It wasn't the Sig Center. It was another side building there. There was a match. Yeah, he was he was training for a comeback, wasn't he, in his early 60s, just before he had yeah. the heart attack, maybe? I, I don't know if he ever I, – I, I have to tell you, I my memory doesn't really serve me to know – I don't believe that match even happened. I think Buddy passed away before that even happened, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, while you search for that, like I was trained by all those guys, including the Sandman, who, man, Sandman used to move and bump and do all those things. So, you know, the basics, people could say that was a bad thing or it makes a lot of sense if they look at my career. But one of the guys who trained me was the Sandman. The main two guys that really took a lot of time with me was J.T. Smith, Jimmy Gennetti. And then, if you remember history, TWA closed down. Joel Goodhart had the radio show in Philadelphia. I think with Carmelo was the co-host. And they announced it was shut down. So I had no place to go. I was trained to a point where I could just bump and feed but or sell, if I even knew what that was. 
but I really had to go and now look for different places either to train or just go in there and get beat up and just get the experience. And Mike Sharp over in Brick Township, New Jersey, was a place that had a school, but also ran exhibition shows every two weeks. So it was like the best of both worlds. And uh, one time I actually was like, I want Mike to get in the ring with me. I want to get chopped. I want to get the forearms and everything. I just, because it would be cool to say I got in the ring with Iron Mike Sharp until Mike got in the ring. And I realized <laughs> he's in the best shape I could, I could ever hope to be in. I'm not. And he's running like that thing. with Mike, like a rrr, rrr, you know, the constant movement. He was a machine, dude. He was a machine. How so did he, he, he used to train by running up and down the stairs of the arenas, didn't he? I think beforehand, that was the old story for like hours on end. He would, he would do that. And also he would, he got famously locked in the Madison square garden. Remember <laughs> yeah. because he was a neat freak and a clean freak. And he took like a, a two or three or four showers and, they closed the building down and he was still taking a shower. Mm. I so, believe that I like to ask something I'm pretty tight with Austin Idol, but I'm sure Dutch knows that story to be true or not. I think it is like 100% true. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. I think a few people have either confirmed it or maybe they confirmed the, the whispers of that story, but everyone seems to say basically the same thing. Did you witness uh, I Mike's OCD sort of firsthand as well? Was he doing, was he showering four times a day at the, uh, while training or after no. training? No. Yeah. No, and it's one of those things, too, that sometimes <laughs> in the beginning, and I, I always tried to respect everybody, but obviously you grew up as a casual fan or a mark, whatever you want to call it, and Mike had that kind of impression that, oh, he's going to lose every time. But there was also, as a kid, I was something fascinating about Mike. Because of his OCD, because he was a character literally larger than life, but also he didn't fit in with the normal person that I was used to in my young life being around, and I think people, you know, just as a side note, don't give guys like Mike Sharp or even Johnny Rods, who's trained a million people that, that are currently like stars today or have been. These guys were like legit, still legitimate, tough guys, legitimate athletes and could go in the ring. They were just booked in a particular spot because it's a it's a fake subjective business. You know, the booker chooses and that's your spot. The only OCD getting back to that that I experienced was that Mike left for like years. He bought a car brand new and he left the window sticker on the car <laughs> until like I stopped going to Iron Mike Sharp school. <laughs> How much was it? Was it like the price sticker? How much was it, it worth? It was the whole thing. The options, what <laughs> standard, <laughs> and everything. Yeah, the big thing that covers the whole back window sometimes. <laughs> That's a new one on me. I like it. I like it. Uh, right, we're going to go to the first person who asked a question. And, oh, right, I, they should be in blue. They've come out in pink. My print is broken. And so old school pro and wrestling. I wear both. It's okay. I wear oh, both. I'm trying to... I'm, no, it's, it's me. I'm trying to squint. I've got the worst eyesight. Ask Steve, he, he, ask Stevie if he remembers working on the very first ECW show. He was involved in ECW's first ever match on February 25th, 1992. Is that true? That's true. Uh, but I did have a match... In 1991, November 10th, 1991, uh, and you'll like this one. This will be cool. good. Dutch will love it too. They didn't have anybody to wrestle Crybaby Waldo, who later became Big Slam Vader, if you remember him from the Indies. He no. looked like Vader, he, but he had a Crybaby gimmick. He came out with the, the diaper, your classic <laughs> indie gimmick, right? Crybaby Waldo. <laughs> and they didn't have anybody to wrestle or just put him over. It's just somebody you could bump and move around and be there. And that, that was me, but they didn't, they, I had a rookies match coming up against Derek Domino at right before they went out of business TWA. So they put me under a mask and they called me boy in the hood. Right. <laughs> hey, I'm right on the nose with that boy. I'm in the hood. I'm a boy. I'm not a man yet. A boy in the hood. But the February 25th, uh, 92 was a Michael Jack sports bar in downtown Philly. And you want to talk about, I mean, it might have been ribbing me or whatever, but you want to talk about being thrown right into the fire. First match ever. And all it was was a 20-minute draw where Jimmy Giannetti beat me up for 20 minutes because I had no clue what I was doing. And he should have beat me up because he just ate me up because I just was, I, I wasn't dead, but I, I don't know when it's time to, when, he, when he's giving me an opening or anything like that. And then at the end, uh, the guy who was friends with this kid, Jeff, had a halberd and came in and hit me 
like so hard with the halberd and gave me a concussion. So my first match, I'm blown up. I'm not in shape. I'm a skinny kid. I'm in over my head. 20 minute time limit draw, and I get it. I get a concussion at the end. <laughs> Welcome to the business. Well, Hello. I mean, it can't get any worse than this. I thought after that, but I was wrong. <laughs> uh, do you know uh, this is from me again? Uh, one of the probably the first match I've ever seen you in. This is after the fact was you wrestling Dory and Terry Funk in a tag match. I can't remember who your partner was. They, they pinned me with a headlock. They pinned you with a headlock. That's exactly <laughs> where I was going. And do you know what? They did it so believably. And I, I just one of those things. I know you. Uh, uh, this might come to the screen behind you as well. Uh, but a lot of wrestlers today could watch that and really learn something. It's like, man, you can any move, if you do it well enough, could be a finish. Or if you do it real enough. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna pin the guy anyway, or he's gonna tap out. But it was it was something that Terry and Dory, that was a very early learning moment too. Of maybe some of my sell was a way too over the top, but I was trying, I'd rather oversell at that point than undersell it, especially for the funks with the reputation they had. Uh, but they that was that if they do that like over and over and over again, I think they tug in and out maybe eight to ten times and then literally headlock take over pin. And got a pretty decent reaction. The people didn't crap on it. Hmm. And for me, I was like, wow, I didn't come out of that saying, oh, you know, I just got pinned with a headlock. And I was, I was like, they were, they were wrenching me up, James. It was, it was no joke. And, you know, they were testing a kid. They didn't try to cauliflower my ear up. And they had told me afterwards they could have very easily have done that. And they didn't want to because I've always been respectful around them, even as early as I was kind of exposed to them. So that was nice, but that I could have very easily had to wear these headphones, like Josh Alexander. I yeah. have to wear the head thing all the time. How many times did you wrestle Terry over in your career? Because obviously we'll probably get to barely legal quite soon, actually. But how many times over the uh, ECW years did you wrestle Terry? Um, I'm trying to think. Like I know, I know, I wrestled Terry obviously at the BWO when I was on that run, and we were wrestling a lot of house shows here and there. And I was getting experience with him of how to do what I didn't do against Gennetti in that first match <laughs> when no open up and just fight all the time. Cause Terry will lay into you and it was good learning experience. But when I was with Raven, I, I'm trying to think, I'm assuming I bumped into Terry as a heel with Raven before the BWO, but I don't think we did because we always had Tommy or Luna. Then we had, um, you know, on our side, Brian Lee, and then the Pitbulls, and the Pitbulls went with Dreamer. There was all that interaction, but I don't think Terry came into that until the thing with Mick, and then we didn't really touch until we were both baby faces. But I'd say probably maybe 10 times, never enough. I, how about if I just say that? <laughs> I could never share a ring enough nor learn enough with somebody like Terry Funk. And you, when you have those opportunities as a young wrestler, you try to make it into as long of a feud as possible so you can get every bit out of it what you want what you want did terry give you any verbal advice that was uh, not that worth taking because i'm sure everything he said was worth taking as advice but anything specific to you that you took to heart rather than not just learning in the ring but something in the back that he may have said to you uh, well, well terry admired the fact that i I came into the business just willing to learn. And I made my mistakes as a young guy. It was The clueless putts thing was real. I was just learning how to navigate wrestling and navigate life at that time. But Terry appreciated that whatever happened, I never came to him with anything but what, what can I do for you? And can you please teach me this? Can I learn? I think the the humility or at least the willingness to learn from him and and follow and not have any preconceived notions because at the time I had the biggest push in my life with the big BWO and as excited as I was and that could have came off as arrogant sometimes to some people Terry understood when it came time I would I would defer to him or I would surrender and say this is a veteran this is a legend and then you know just whatever he had to offer and that's what he would say to me too he's like as long as you keep this attitude and you always want to do for others because terry was really known even though he was so intense and he could do everything if you watch terry funk's matches they are so selfless and giving to the other person or people that are around him including myself and that's the biggest lesson just by example 
what I learned. If, if it's good enough for Terry to sell, if Terry's not too good to do a job or to put somebody over or to look vulnerable, then what right do any of us have? Do you, uh, do you know, I was going to ask something else then. Do you remember the, do you remember the day when uh, Cactus Jack nearly set Terry on fire and then he did set the fan on fire? Yeah, they, they slipped off the chair. Well, I, you know, we weren't quite, uh, we weren't quite scientists back there in the locker room. <laughs> I didn't quite understand. It wasn't like, <laughs> it's just funny how you think like in wrestling, you can, you can hit somebody with a fire extinguisher. You can run them over with a car. You can commit a felony, but if, felony, but if there's a TV camera, it's okay. Hmm. This time it wasn't okay, <laughs> but yeah, it was a, when I saw the chair being lit up, wrapped up in a, you know, chairs wrapped in a rag, you know, whatever lighter fluid, like the table usually gets lit up. All I could think was, man, I hope he doesn't hit him too much because what if the, the rag goes onto the mat and then the whole ring lights on fire, you know, what could be worse than that? What happened was worse. <laughs> <laughs> so there's my answer. And it was, yeah, it was, and Terry came back afterwards, um, rightfully so. A angry, the crazy Terry Funk that you saw kind of in Japan beating up the fan. He was going through, throwing the big, like, floor fans. You've ever seen those big steel floor fans back in the day? Yeah. Throwing that, MF and this, M and F and that, like, turned and looked at me and just gave that Terry Funk look on TV where he looked like he wanted to kill you. And like, I just kind of backed up. He walked into a room, probably 30 seconds later, probably composed himself, came back. And then there's regular, Hey everybody. I'm so sorry. Everybody. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and I was doing my thing. Like he's he seemed calm, but I was still doing that like perimeter thing where I wouldn't go near him. Mm. Until I knew, like, until he called me over, and I was like, I, ha I have to. It's like, yeah, don't go in the sphere of influence or something like. I'm surprised. I'm surprised that this was one of the only incidents of ECW that happened in the ring that actually went to court. I think the mass transit one went to court after a while. Yeah, then... yeah, that one went to court as well, but there really wasn't that many. But I think, but I think, didn't did the fan try and sue? Maybe. I don't know. I know there was a lot of T-shirts coming from the merch table into that front row. They, they were giving out. Yeah, that's what we were oh, trying right. to get. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good man. Good man. Uh, if you're an ECW, when you fought the fans, or because there were fights with the fans and things happened, usually a few T-shirts, some autographs and pictures would, would solve it. But second-degree burns may have been the yeah. over the threshold. Yeah, five T-shirts wasn't going to... Cure, yeah, what's, cure well, yeah, what do you think the over-under on? If you got <laughs> second-degree burns at a wrestling show, what would it take to keep you from suing? Yeah, uh, seven. Seven T-shirts and a photo. Seven. Wow. Hey, you know, I'm a, my, everyone's got a price for uh, me. Not, not that well. Not, not, forget about a million dollar man. Yeah. Uh, right, we're going to move on. Um, do, 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 do. Where am I going to ask first? Ah, this, right, there's a million of these. I'll ask maybe just two. Wayne's World of Modeling asks, whose idea was it for the mid-shirt and booty shorts? Oh, absolutely. Raven's yep. Raven's idea, because obviously, like I said, I didn't have a clue. And I know there's people out there commented, like, how could he not want to do it? Like I initially, my own personal insecurity and maybe whatever I had, even in that short stage of my, my career, my pride to you know, to look at that and go, I, I can't wear that. And then when Raven explained it to me, it, it that you want to talk about the best advice I've ever gotten in my career. I mean, I've gotten a lot of advice that ranks in a, kind of 1A, 1B, 1C, but I think 1A has to be when Raven explained to me what the Daisy Dukes and the the, the half shirt represented. Obviously, a, a, a you know, a goofy compliment to him. So we kind of compliment each other and we both stand out in the act. But the most important thing was, listen, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, if you do this or you should do this, you better do it. If you're smart, you're going to stand out. You, you can never be a tough guy in this company. You can never be a legitimate fighter. We have all these legitimate things here. You will not stand out. You wear this and become a chicken shit heel. I guarantee you when we tag up, you're going to be getting the pin every night. You're going to be getting the most amount of heat. You're going to be the biggest heel in this company because these people will take one look at you and say, you don't deserve to win. You don't deserve to be a champ. You don't deserve anything. They're going to hate you. 
they think they're smart, but you're going to show them how stupid they are and how they fall for it. It's some along those lines. Basically, this is how you stand out by doing the opposite of everybody else. And when you're talking about reinventing yourself, that's been looking at everything, the, the motivation for anything I've done. How can I stand out and be completely different for good, bad, bad or indifferent than everybody else out there on the roster? How much fun did you... I, I presume you had your input as well. How much fun did you have choosing the band T-shirts that you would be wearing? I legitimately like those bands, so it wasn't even that... <laughs> It wasn't even, I'm 51, so I'm still a child of the 80s and the hair bands and all that stuff. Uh, Raven gave me a list of what I should because he wanted to make sure they were the most out of touch, uncool at that grunge time. Because when ECW was around, it was all Nirvana, grunge rock, Seattle, the music videos that Paul stole the music from the companies to use. <laughs> and a little fun fact there that we didn't ask for permission. We asked for forgiveness but when it airs at 2 a.m you don't need to do either so that was the biggest like departure from the entire identity of the show so basically the more they went into the cool music the grunge rock the whatever was current the extreme games all that stuff my character went the opposite way and got over even more it was it was really cool uh was the winger t-shirts an homage to beavis and butthead was Bees and Butthead, were they even around in 90? 92, 93, they came out, yeah. So I think uh, I think they're lame little, fr- like, there was ACDC Metallica, but then their, like, their friend who they hated always wore the winger T-shirt. <laughs> I remember the good, the good nerdy guy who was like me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, the, the thing about those shirts, and it's how I still live, I, I, went, to, I went to Goodwill and a bunch of other places and clearance <laughs> racks and clearance boxes, so it was really... Whatever was a dollar or two dollars, that's what I ended up getting. Have you have you still got some of them? I mean, because if like a, an original Stevie worn match worn winger t shirt signed, that's all I got. I'm not a big, even though this this is basically the, these things back here. The BWO is the original outfit from the original, you know, November November night. Yeah, I, I held on to that. Uh, I don't know if I fit in it anymore. Maybe now that I lost all the weight, but but. I'm not big on memorabilia. These things hold hold meaning because my friend made me the ECW tag belt and then uh, the BWO belt, the guy made it for me and Nova myself. So he put that much effort in that. And then my wife insisted the BWO go in the shadow box. Hmm. But finish your thought about how I, how I lost all this money by not holding on to these after-shirts. <laughs> how, much do you think I, how much do you think it cost me? Uh, do, do you know, uh, oh God, uh, probably people still love ECW, man, after... How long has it been gone now? 22 years? Yeah. People still love very, it. People still talk. I mean, we're, we're still talking about it. it. Very fortunate. It's just to be able, if you can do one thing in your career as a wrestler to be remembered for, that's really great. But like you said, I've I've been able to kind of reinvent and have some semblance of memories created with those characters. And that's, that's an immense blessing, mm-hmm. right? People don't get that opportunity sometimes to do once in their career and i got many opportunities with uh do you know i'm actually going to skip barely legal i'm going to skip when you're on raw we've got so much to get through um this one might have an interesting answer what's the most controversial story you were a part of in ecw aside from the crucifixion angle i would say maybe today would have been that creepy birthday party video where i wasn't there but they 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 got me over by saying i was filming it when raven uh took uh sam Ann's wife and his kid and they had a birthday party and it was just such a it had that vibe of like texas chainsaw massacre <laughs> with the family sitting around the diet it was just so dysfunctional uh it could be deemed controversial because in today's climate you do something like that and you're stealing this and you're doing i mean everything could be in today's climate too controversial but i feel like that had such a real grungy, creepy type of feel to it that it could offend a lot of people. So you don't think it would have been as offensive having Blue Meanie naked on a children's park in the middle of the night filming vignettes then? See, that's where I see... That could be like part two weird stuff. Hey, I'll do something that wrestlers don't do a whole lot. I'll admit I was wrong. You're absolutely right about that. Yes. Yes, that was... 
I don't know if he got put on a list after that <laughs> statute of limitations. <laughs> he just got, we did have the cops come, by the way. The cops did come at me, like everything in ECW, whenever we shot that kind of stuff, like that, going to Times Square, Stevie kicking Santa Claus, knocking over the karaoke guys thing. Uh, the cops would show up like five seconds afterwards, which basically was the pattern of ECW with barely legal, the transformer blue 10 seconds. Like there's so many things that we literally, you may have never known happened, but the cops showed up and asked what was happening. And of course your, your favorite interview to Sam and goes, I got this. Everybody stand back. <laughs> hey. And I go, well, I go to Raven. I go, he's literally double fisting a beer talking to the cops. He goes, don't worry. He'll get us out of it. I was like, I really don't believe he will. <laughs> Public that relations Sandman. What's that? I said public relations Sandman to the rescue there. Yeah, I heard he's got a part in the negotiator sequel, the one with Samuel Jackson <laughs> and Kevin Spacey. Do, do you know what? Actually, just because I asked it, because I can't mention it without not mentioning it, I remember you first talking about this on the ECW Rise and Fall. Was it the Rise and Fall or, or anyway, uh, of uh, ECW DVD when you were doing the crucifixion thing and you said you were Catholic and you were looking at me and you're going, this is, this is really messed up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, my my church didn't want anything to do with me after. That. Oh, really? I was like, of all the episodes to watch, you guys don't watch it, and then, yeah, it was. I understand in a way, but you know, you, you when you're as creative and you're a genius like Scotty is, Raven, which he is, you you'll go too far because how are you going to know what too far is? You're not going to know. I mean, and you know, I I just. That whole thing, and Kurt Angle was there that night. Yeah, I know yeah, that's yeah. A big part, but but that was a blessing in disguise too. Because what if Kurt Angle ended up spending some of his career in ECW instead of really being trained from the ground up at tracks by Doctor Tom and all that stuff, and his career might have been a whole lot different. I always, um, sorry, I was flipping papers and got a pen in my uh, mouth there. I always thought it was weird that that whole thing, the crucifix thing, was on the floor rather than in the ring, and that's probably just for logistical reasons of, do you know what I mean, trying to like get the cross in there and, it, and there's nothing to lean it on. But I always thought it was weird that only like one side of the arena could actually see it. Yeah, I mean, we weren't... I, I mean, if we had thought about that, I would have used that as an excuse not to do it. I was like, oh, nobody's going to see it. We're hard camera. Nah, I just, I love to do it. It just doesn't make sense. But... um. <laughs> But yeah, that was that was something that who who knows like today like how offensive that will be. I don't even know if it's up on the network. I, I assume it's not. I th I'm gonna guess it is in the full show. In the full, do you know what? Someone tell me. Someone tell me in the comments if it is. We're yeah, gonna move be on. Good comment because I would I would think that that would not make the light of day. Oh, there's some stuff that they left on for years and have only just started editing out. I'll, I'll tell you about them afterwards. Naughty That's words. Some ECW fans in the uh, digital archives over there. Oh yeah. Oh, there's some bits that were really f funny at the time, and it's something like things like fans may have yelled out, or Mike Tyson yelled out, or things like that that have now since they've got wise to it and muted. Anyway, uh, we can't get off ECW. Oh, God, so many ECW questions. I'm skipping. I'm sorry, everybody. But we can't not talk about the BWO. Uh, Steve Griffin asks, did it surprise you how over the BWO got? For a while, BWO was the biggest thing in ECW. Uh, and I always want to uh, mention this as well. Famous parodies include Kiss. Everyone in ECW is a Kiss fan, it seems. Baron Von Stevie, the Jackson 5, which I don't remember. <laughs> but um, go uh, we'll go back to the first bit of the question for uh, in a second. But what are some of the lesser remembered BWO parodies that have, have got a place in your heart? Well, the first one, I believe, was the fabulous ones where I had the worst Fargo strut, meaning with a close second. But it was the Fargo strut. And as a matter of fact, that's when uh, Mick was leaving ECW and we did the Rockette thing. And then we fight Fargo strutted out of the arena together. Um, the Jackson five was, was in Reading, Pennsylvania. It was in the building of Damien Kane. I think he promoted that building for Indies. He was the manager of the bad crew and we did it. And Nova is a huge Michael Jackson fan. So he was doing like real Michael Jackson dance moves and all this stuff and that, but it was, it was pretty offensive to some degree. <laughs> like, you know, we dressed just like the Jacksons. So it was. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And that's, once again, Raven Raven came 99% of what we've done got over and didn't get 
any kind of ooh, you know what I mean? Mm. But that one parody was just, you know, never going to make TV. Yeah, with um, with the BDO, BWO, you, you said before, you know, with the, with the shorts and the half-cut T-shirts and stuff like that, and Raven taught you, just trust me on this, people will hate you more and you'll be more popular because of it. Did you think the BWO was sort of a continuation of just annoying the fans and therefore getting more popular? I mean, were you surprised by how popular BWO still is? Well, yeah, I'm absolutely shocked at how popular it is today after all this time. But at the time, I was surprised. But that initial reaction and chanting BWO, that's, you know, Paul. So it was just like that. You knew you got him. I, I knew, but I, I was, didn't have that big awareness of where it was going to lead. We just did the show. Anything we did in ECW, James, was basically we were always on the edge of our seat. Like, how much longer is this going to last? We're just going to keep trying to do this and keep trying to, to make a name for ourselves and do whatever we can. And the BWO, we knew we had something right there. And then when Paul said, we're going to make some T-shirts, then we kind of knew we'd at least be around for a few weeks or mm. maybe months. If, in fact, that's my next question. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to keep this to yourself, but how much money did the BWO merchandise make? And at the time, was Paul kicking any money back to you for this, uh, you know, royalties, or was that just not not in Paul's lexicon? Well, if you're familiar with Paul Heyman and financials, mm. then, but I'll just say this. The opportunity to do something where I'm still making money at, at something related to the BWO or the three of us can sign autographs. Paul gave the opportunity. Paul gave the TV time and ran with it. So, you know, I didn't get, I got paid $225 total for the BWO shirts. But what I, what I gained from that was basically I can sell shirts on pro wrestling tees. Now I can have BWO signings. I can be big Stevie Cole. I, I have a lifetime of, of being able to recoup whatever money was supposedly owed to me from the t-shirts. So, so there's no, nothing in writing that said you get a percentage or whatever. And even in WWE, I'm sure Dutch has talked about this. By the way, I'm a big fan of Dutch's show. I listen to a lot of stuff just to reinforce or even learn stuff that I might've had a bad, uh, the wrong idea about the way things should work psychology wise and stuff. But remember Dutch, What's his way? He said point zero 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 something of the net, not the gross from merch. So WWE does the same thing. Mm -hmm. How did you end up with the trademark of BWO then? Because I mean, with WWE being so trademark happy, especially after ECW shut down, the Dudley Boys is a great example. In two thousand five, they couldn't keep the name, even though it was an ECW. So how did you end up with the uh, uh, BWO trademark? WWE kind kind of leaves me to do my own thing. They really do. Um, and with the Dudleys, this is going to speak on it too. I give them all the credit in the world because they reinvented their name in TNA and then other places. And then Bubba the Bully Ray was a big transformation that, you know, these guys know how to reinvent themselves. So mm. WWE saying you can't be the Dudley boys because we own it or whatever. Fine. Brand new merch, brand new gimmick, brand new game. You know, like the real workers can overcome that stuff. Mm. Uh, but they've never, I, maybe because it's a parody, James, because WCW couldn't sue uh, ECW because it was a parody. Maybe WWE doesn't have a true exclusive trademark. Just guessing. Uh, maybe they don't have an exclusive trademark because you can't exclusively trademark a parody of something. So with the Stevie Richards name, do you have the copyright on that or the trademark on that should be specifically, or was there any RG bargy with ECW when you left WWE? Because they said, no, we own Stevie Richards, et cetera, like the Dudley boys. No, the, with this, and it took about 10 years of being in the company, I guess, to build up any kind of cachet to even request anything. But the real truth of it is, every time I negotiated my contract, it was literally like, here's, here's your pay and that's it. As a matter of fact, they had a, a little trick that they would do with a lot of talents and they do it a lot in football. It's not just exclusive to wrestling, but basically they would use me as much as they could on those first two years of a three-year deal. I'd be paid the, the minimum $75,000 guaranteed downside and maybe make a little bit more during the year, but very little that I ever go above that guarantee. Year three would be the big jump, like either to 125 or 150 or whatever it would be they would take me off the road and not have me do anything for a while before the third year is about to come up and they would renegotiate it back to the 75, 75, and then 120. They would do that 
uh, two to three times. So long story short, the last contract that I negotiated, I still, I knew there were, it was a week to week thing. They weren't doing anything with me. I put everybody over more than once that I could put over. They were going to release me at any time. So when Johnny Ace called me into the office and said, I want to negotiate with you on it. You know, what would you like from us? Like, well, they never asked me that. So um, 750 grand free rental car, free hotel per diem for food. First class travel. He laughed. He laughed. He laughed and I laughed and he goes, I, I can't give you that. And I was like, well, dude, I got a 50, 50 shot. And if I don't ask, how am I going to know? Right. So he goes, and I go, but let me guess 75, 75, 125. He goes, no, actually, uh, 75, 75, 75. Oh, I was God. like, okay, <laughs> at least you're honest this time. And he goes, he goes, seriously though. And he goes, and he was at least honest. He goes, you know, this probably will be your last contract with this company. If you even last that long, what can I put in here that you want that they'll say yes to? And I said, I would like to own my name. And he goes, well, which name? Because I was Steven and Stevie. I go, I love to own Stevie. Do you guys want to keep Steven? Because you created that with the right to censor. I get that. That's the, the name associated. But I would like to remain Stevie Richards. I've been Stevie Richards since day one. To me, at least, let me be consistent after I leave with the company and see what's next. And he said that he said something that was a harsh truth. And he goes, I know they're going to say yes to that because your name is worthless here. Your character is worthless. You've, you know, you're, you're just not part of anybody's plans. I go, and I could have very easily said, how could you say that to me? And all, but to me, I was like, I'm going to get what I want. So go ahead. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm a piece of shit. And I just walked, you know, they put it in an addendum and they, I own the name. Now they probably wouldn't have bothered me about using Stevie Richards. Once again, they don't, they don't and shouldn't care. At the level I was at, I was a good hand. I put people over. I worked my ass off, but nobody owes anything after that thing was over. Hmm. That's that's my thought. Uh, I sort of want to uh, double back on merchandise and stuff like that again because I was wondering, with uh, you know ECW obviously made no money on the merch there because Paul was in charge, but with WWE especially, what did you make the best money with? Was it any other merch? Uh, I don't know if Right Sensor had any merchandise, but like the figures or the game likeness royalties, where were the best royalty checks coming from? Yeah, but the video game back when it, it was more so like you you really were fortunate because there was limited spots to get paid the royalties on the video games. And this was before they would sneak people in for free on the DLC, but you wouldn't get royalties on DLC and stuff. So when I was in the games, it was a big deal. The action figures were also a big deal back then. And I actually got friendly with this guy, Pete, who worked for Jack Specific. A totally cool guy, great guy. We talked a lot about games and sports and everything but wrestling. And as you can imagine, somebody who is not part of the locker room or part of whatever, some of the guys weren't very nice to him or they just didn't know who he was. Where my attitude was, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to be even nicer to him because I just don't know who he is. And I'm just going to make sure you just never know who you're talking to. So we became friends. And the funniest thing would be, you look at, I had like eight action figures. And this is during the Stevie Knight heat or I'm not getting used, not during right to censor or BWO. This is like when I wasn't getting pushed. But Pete, every time I would have a new outfit, and actually when we first met, he goes, how many outfits do you have? I go, well, not many. He goes, get some new outfits made, take some pictures of all four sides of them and everything, as long as they're kind of the same setup or whatever. Email me some high-res photos. And don't say anything else. <laughs> so he was because I was kind to him, or at least I was friendly to him and didn't treat him like he was a nobody, which he, nobody's a nobody. Everybody's somebody. Um, he ended up doing that for me. And I always thanked him. And I, if I see him today, I thank him because he did me a big favor to, to go to bat for me to get that done. With, uh, with that being said, what's your favorite bit of merch and what's your least favorite bit of merch featuring you? Well, my favorite bit of merch in general that we didn't have growing up as kids is those like crazy replica belts that are real belts. We didn't have those as kids. We had the little like foam and kind of plasticky belts. 
probably my my action figures for me personally, the action figures in the video games are in my mind, at least a way that I'm going to be immortalized. And yeah. if someone picks up an action figure or, or plays that game, it, that's how you live in perpetuity. In my, in my opinion, the moments I made or the moments I was a part of are great, but to actually have a company make a mold, spend the tens of thousands of dollars to make a mold of you invest in that and then put it out there and distribute it. It's a, it's a big deal. So it's an honor. Uh, this is from a fan, N64 Gamers. So from that name, you may know where this one's going. Uh, he would love to hear your Stevie comment. Uh, uh, completely read that wrong. Would love to hear Stevie comment on being one of the main top heels in the story mode of arguably the best wrestling game ever made, WWF No Mercy. And I can agree with that as well. Yeah, no, Nintendo 64, No Mercy, uh, WCW Revenge is right up there. The N64 was an amazing system and and to be that i think wasn't no mercy where they had big show and i replaced him as the boss in the story mode or the bad guy there's a big meme out there i replaced benoit obviously that's always going to be if, the if, if it was the off. right to censor era i think that would have been no mercy it was right to censor era yeah, yeah. no mercy was like right to censor but i think big show is some part of that game and i replaced big show because he still lets me know about it when i talk to him He's, like, <laughs> yeah, because he he wasn't in the game at all, was he? So I'm trying no, to think. Was this when he was sent happened. down to OVW at that time? Oh wow, maybe, yeah. But I but that's the meme. And once again, comment below and let us know. But I think that was, and I didn't know this until after I was even out of WWE that that was even a a thing that happened. Did uh, what does Big Show say when he? But he reminds you of this. Oh, fact. I cost him money and all this stuff. Like, dude, you got a million dollar contract stuff. He's a great guy, by the way. You want to talk about one of the guys? He, he, I'll say it throughout this this video, or if we get to do a part two or part three. But you know, to have good people after the business and be able to interact with them, and and Paul is a guy that reached out when I was sick to see how I was doing and checked in and made sure that you know and he everybody's busy so even if you just checked in once during that time that's that's a big deal to me that doesn't go unnoticed and he's a really really great guy and talk about somebody who got himself in shape yeah after like when it's hardest as you get older that guy that guy's doing a great job he was he was about ready to retire at that point as well and then what didn't he go into like the box oh, oh no we're talking way later aren't we uh fun, fun fact about that is right before he got released Paul and I bought gloves and everything because I used to I used to spar with with Kane. We used to do like like a lot of like just sparring center mass, hit for center mass. Well, sometimes I'd pop them a little high, but <laughs> <laughs> I look at them. It doesn't affect him. But Paul and I were planning to do boxing training because he did say, I'm taking my cardio and my physical fitness more seriously. And I'd love for you to join me because I know you'll push me. And then I got released the next week. But I was very much looking forward to doing that kind of sparring with him because it would have been so much fun. Yeah. I, uh, I I just want to correct myself there. He started doing the boxing thing around 2006, sort of around the time he was retiring. And then he got really fit as a fiddle, like in the mid 2010s or something, like some of the biggest he abs I've ever seen. Him. Yeah, he got fit too, or he was starting to get in shape for the Mayweather thing at a WrestleMania in Orlando. So, but I think he wasn't quite where he wanted to be. And then two years later is when he he wanted to get back into really being fed, and I got released hmm. in, in 2008. Uh, we're going to talk a couple of WCW things now. And right before we talk about the story of how you got to WCW, uh, Jay Harlem 25th asks, sorry about all the caps, he's written all the caps, but ask Stevie, is it true that when he signed with WCW, Scott Hall ripped him by saying Kevin Nash was looking for you, Mr. Big Stevie Cool? Yes. <laughs> Tell you about the story, I don't when know. I it's actually one of my favorite moments. Because that Scott's always had a thing, and rest in peace to Scott. It's a shame he's not around because you want to talk about a guy that gave, wanted to give a lot to younger opponents and back to the business and was a workhorse in doing that. But when he saw me, he, and dude, you got to think, I've never met any of these guys, any of them, none of them, not even a, a call or a tag. Yeah, back then it was, you know, there wasn't really texting or, getting online or anything outside of like prodigy at the time. But uh, yeah, I walked in that building. I'm like, what? Do, I don't know what to expect. And then that's when Scott shook my hand. He's like, I'm a big 
fan. I'm a big fan, man. But oh, Kev, look out. He's going. So I I didn't avoid Kevin, but then again, I wasn't looking for Kevin at the same time. So, and he's pretty easy to spot down a hallway. So even if I saw, <laughs> but I was trying to formulate how I would just like say, Hey guys, I had nothing to do with that and whatever. And for people laughing, it's a, it's a, it was a different time. It was still in between really protecting your business and exposing whatever. And also you got to remember the reputation of these guys from the click in WWE. I'm thinking I'm very day one that they can't take a joke, that they don't have a good outlook on her. They don't see it as a sign of respect, but disrespect. All these things run through my mind. So when uh, Scott said that, obviously I'm scared. Like, oh man, what's going to happen? You know, be, getting beat up is easy, but getting fired day one, that's the hard part. So right before I went and got into my rental car, I just, I literally felt he's so tall. I feel his hair <laughs> up the temple. <laughs> my, so I turn around and I look up at him and it should have been filmed because it was great. Well, 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 big CB cool. We meet at last. And my back is up against the, the rattle car. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm I'm just want to let you know, I'm so sorry. And I go, Paul wanted us to do it. And I never met disrespect. And he was like, hmm. So he just got it. He goes, all right, we'll see about that. Or something like to let me sweat it. He gets in his rattle car and he calls me over. And he goes, dude, I'm just messing with you. He goes, we all think it's fantastic. And I go. I could have just fell on the ground, <laughs> passed out. And I was just like, man, I, I, we, we love doing it, but we wanted to reach out to you. But I was scared that what would you say if I called? He goes, dude, don't worry about it. He goes, did you at least get paid for the shirts? And I was like, no. And he goes, now I got heat with you. That's what he <laughs> Did you ever hear what but Hulk I, thought about it? Did, did, did you ever get any feedback from Hulk? If you know Hulk Hogan or you met him, he loves everything you do. Yeah. He's such a big fan. It's so much, brother, I pop for everything you do, which automatically when he said that, I'm like, we're so buried. Oh, my God. <laughs> but Hogan had to watch out more for Raven because Raven was an overact coming in to WCW. You talk about a guy who made the, the cover of the video game, WCW versus yeah. NWO, yeah. with the NWO. Like the WCW guy you picked was Raven. I mean, that's a guy, I'll, I'll go, we'll talk about it, but... I owe my career to that guy. I say it all the time. And Raven should have been a much bigger star and made millions of dollars in this business, much like a Sabu and other guys that that gave everything. I, I'm interested now. So Hulk and Raven then. So uh, this is off the top of my head. I'm sure you'll correct me, but he starts appearing in the crowd for weeks or even months on end. In storyline, he's got a really special contract where he can basically dictate his own terms you come in quite soon afterwards, but you mentioned Hulk and Raven then. So Hulk, Raven was on Hulk's radar very early. If he wasn't on his radar, he was on the radar of somebody close that was giving him tabs about Raven being over or here and there. But with the hype and with everything, and obviously Raven had a great introduction by not wrestling and getting the character over and having me there to take all the punishment. I mean, I think it was like eight weeks of contract negotiations and holding hands with JJ Dillon yeah. and dragging him down to the th dude. I have to say about that segment when that's probably my favorite, one of my favorite segments of all time is being able to riff and improv with JJ Dillon and Gene Okerlund live in front of a crowd. All that stuff was not even rehearsed. <laughs> like, you know, you had your bullet points that he's going to tear the contract up. He's going to hit me. We didn't even have an outline, but that's what we had Gene Okerlund for. And just the, like I saw so much potential in that. And even JJ, like, like legitimately playing it up super serious and me Hulk dragging him by the hand and telling him he needs the exercise. Like, like <laughs> that's what's missing today of being able to kind of make fun of the authority figures and make a, them kind of a goof on, on the situation. I, I find it quite sad almost that the flock never really mixed with the NWO at all. And now that you've said, well, Hulk Hogan saw Raven and how popular he was, do you think it was, do you think maybe the Raven's flock thing maybe would have been more popular, but the fact that they already seemed like they were going to be maybe popular enough to maybe challenge the NWO in that sense sort of kept them a, a rung below? Yeah, I mean, there's a saying, I don't know if Dutch ever brings it up, but do good, but don't do good. 
what was it? <clears throat> sorry i was coughing no, all over that i muted okay. it but how dare you uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry say hey, it again there's a saying in the locker room most times do good but don't do too good uh-huh you should do too good theoretically, but sometimes when you do too good too fast, you get on those radars and you don't have the political strength or affiliations to prevent getting buried mm. or prevent getting your legs cut out from under you, which I believe Raven in the end, like you look at his contributions, especially in WCW, uh, he was the first guy to give Goldberg a competitive match that that made sense and made Goldberg even more over. Like Goldberg was selling for the first time and got more over mm. as a baby face in the end. That's Raven. Raven put that together. Raven made that happen. And Raven brought Goldberg way up to the next level. Yeah. I love the, uh, the flock where it, I'm sure Raven describes it where I can't remember, but it's essentially almost like the com- comedy way of doing a run in, but only one at a time. Not dog everybody go. Show. What was that? Dog and pony show. The dog and pony show. Yeah, I, I, it's so classic wrestling that it doesn't make sense to anyone who doesn't get wrestling, but within the sphere of wrestling, it's the best thing in the world. I would tell somebody if they're ever in a real fight, it looks like the recreated NWO surrounding Sting in the ring, it's not going to end the same way. <laughs> they're not going to feed you one at a time to get jammed with a bat and wait. Uh, because we sort of mentioned Raven, the flock, you coming in, give us a sort of... Uh, and I'm sorry to say that we're not getting to the neck injury in ECW, but uh, y- your neck is injured in a Terry Funk match. We'll, hopefully we'll talk about it in a part two, if you're willing to do a part two. Uh, sure. Why did you end up going to WCW instead of returning to ECW? Well, the neck had a little bit to do with it, but also at the same time, there's the, there's a point in your life as a young... That's why I give credit to all the young wrestlers in AEW, Impact, WWE, guys and girls that are my age now, like on TV back then, a hey, being 23, 24 years old or around there, I didn't understand the time and the money uh, of a TV investment of a character investment in a promotion. So there was a lot of things that towards the end, obviously money wise with Paul and other things that every talent has experienced, but I handled it probably poorly by just going to WCW and not finishing up mm. my time in the ECW. So making mistakes like that. And then as a young person with not good, good guidance from an actual mentor that could say, I have 40 years in the business and I'm trying to tell you how to be a better businessman about this. I started to make mistake upon mistake. Then if you touch on a neck injury, I knew I needed neck surgery. So right there, your emotions are all kind of twisted. You don't know. There's a very much a big finality in your twenties that in your thirties, forties, and even fifties, yeah, perspective and go, man, there's a lot of life to live left. There's a, you, you learn the patience and perspective you don't know in your twenties. So, and I did in the rise and fall DVD apologize to the guys and everybody. I ended up disrespecting that opportunity and that TV time that guys were quite frankly, looking to kill to, to get, I was very fortunate to do that. So it, um, you know, that WCW thing, that's how I came to go there but it really was a big mistake to go at that time or to go at all. With uh, I don't know if this is a, a more delicate sort of subject for you, but was this around the time that there was supposedly a mole in ECW? I don't know if this is like the Todd Gordon thing who maybe... Oh, the Todd Gordon thing, yeah. Yeah, was this, a, was this something where somebody with an ECW facilitated you going over to WCW in that sense? No, Raven, Raven facilitated it by talking to Bischoff, and Bischoff offered the deal to me. So... That's that's the way that when uh, the Todd Gordon mole mole story started probably at the when when right after the pay per view or around the first pay per view. So when the BWO was super popular and then Raven was obviously hitting a point where he could go to either company at the time. Uh, but the mole thing with Todd was he was very tight to Sandman, Public Enemy, Two Cold Scorpio. Uh, I believe he was still close with Kevin Sullivan, who was back in WCW. Um, so those were the, those, I believe were the guys, maybe even new Jack and other guys like Axel, there was, there's guys, spinoff guys that, but the main core of who Todd hung out with, and I was very tight with Todd too, but we never had 
that conversation about going to WCW. With uh, ECW around this time, because a lot of people are jumping, you know, there's big money contracts being handed out ever since the NWA, uh, NWA, NWO goes over and then, you know, the whole war thing. Was there at this time a potential ECW invasion of WCW, like a formal ECW invasion uh, that was ever proposed to you? No, but WCW was making it look that way with uh, Public Enemy, Raven, myself, who else um, showed up there? Had Louis Bacalli there, and you had you had it pretty much everybody from ECW that eventually, well, Mikey Whipwreck went there, um, Sabu went there, so there was tons of guys. So why would you pay to say, you know, who's there a guy? Sandman, he was there. Oh, well, Sandman, of course. Hardcore Hack, Hack, wasn't he? Yeah. They killed him. They made him preppy and everything, playing chess with Raven. That was so funny, though. I love it. it I love great. how Raven was next door neighbors with Jim, and they just—I think they just called him Jim on the first one. Yeah, and uh, Raven did the the broke the fourth wall and said, "What a maroon!" and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, do you know what? We're going to go for a bit. I was going to say about oh, I was going to say about the um, you know, the whole thing. Why would you? I mean, it would have been smart for Turner to want to buy ECW and have a harder edge show on TBS or TNT, but why buy it when you can just sign everybody that wants to leave anyway? Yeah. Uh, I was just sort of thinking, do you think, uh, you know, with you and Raven, instead of doing like the flock thing, they could have just called it like a, the hardcore group and done it that way? Or did it, that was just never on the cards? It could have been hardcore invasion, it could yeah. have been whatever, you know, and then you had obviously Shane and all those guys leave not long after that. I have, I'm tr I really don't want to skip name association, but I've got so many questions I want to ask you. Um... So I'm not going to. I'm going to do name association because I like it. Uh, okay. I'm going to give you uh, some descriptors, some sentences. I don't know if you've seen these before, but you just tell me the first name that comes to mind. Maybe a tiny little story with it as well. We'll see. First question is, funniest person in the locker room? Any locker room? I'd have to put that Booker T's commentary at the monitor, which legitimately got him a commentary job. Oh, did it? <laughs> one of the funniest things of commentary. Yeah, this guy over here, look at it. You just listen to NXT or watch it. That's Booker T kind of commentating at the uh, monitor, but he's a very funny guy when it comes to that. I know you're married, but the most beautiful uh, woman, either wrestler or valet or whatever, in real life instead of on TV. I would have to say Victoria would probably be the one person who, you know, and you factor in age too, that's still taking care of herself and still a beautiful girl. Yeah. The, uh, the one I always ask, smelliest wrestler. Nice wrestler. Oh man, probably Balls Mahoney. Yeah, yeah, you'd be stunned how often that name comes up. <laughs> oh, because what Balls? What you saw him wearing the ring is what he wore at the gym because he worked out. Wore at the rental car place, which he rented cars with no driver's license, which was amazing. <laughs> Danny Doring and I watched that in amazement. Whether he's outside reading the book or anything like that, that's the way Balls was, Captain Caveman. But much like Mike Sharp. That's what you want in the business. 24-7 Balls Mahoney. <laughs> um, not that many people have a name for this, but the biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. Who would call up Meltzer or Keller or whoever? In history? Maybe somebody you know, but you might want to plead the fifth. Paul Heyman. Okay. Uh, we get that name quite a lot. Most in trouble with The Office. Uh, let's say WWE. Who was most in trouble with WWE in The Office? Were you? <laughs> Well, I would just sometimes get in trouble because I would make calls out there to put guys over. I would take their finish. But if we could go home a couple minutes early and save the main event sometime, if it took six minutes to do a, like a completely predictable finish with me losing, why would I be out there 10 minutes? Hmm. And I would say I was given the main event, uh, like, you know, we gave you a couple extra minutes and the heat would pass. We... That's a worker, though. Why would yeah. I take extra bumps for two minutes? and shorten my career when it doesn't nobody yeah everybody's like yeah we just came back from the marine trailer stevie richards in the ring this is a toss-up who's gonna win this one <laughs> i just uh just had barry horowitz on and he had the exact opposite great guy, great guy yeah he was he was great to interview as well and um he had the exact opposite but same answer it's like because he'd always go a bit too long it's like hey the match needed 15 minutes not 13 and it was a great match the people told us you know so i, I always like that uh the strangest sight you ever witnessed at the travel lodge not too many because i didn't i didn't partake in any of that stuff i usually played video games did the same thing i did throughout my whole life we talked about it before we went on the air so 
a lot of stuff like, well, there were some, I think there was a couple of times that like they were stretching out a dead body, like more than <laughs> once people, there was murder or somebody OD'd and died. And the first thing you think of as a wrestler, when they're wheeling out a stretcher with the, mm. the body bag is like, is that one of us? Sandman. No, he was, he's been dead for like 20 years. He <laughs> keeps going. <laughs> Uh, oh, me and my glasses, uh, or lack of them. The most dangerous. I got right here for you. Oh, dude. Oh, do you know, I'm thinking because obviously I'm like quite English. I'm thinking of wearing a monocle. Maybe that might add to the aura. I don't you know. Get a pocket watch like Cody has. He's got a pocket watch. He's got a pocket watch, oh, dude. Dude. I quite like that, actually. I always see him with the three piece suit, so it's sort of. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, we are going to go with the most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in. Wrestling related, though. Potential, the potential dangerous situation where it could have went sideways was one night stand and already went kind of sideways with, with John and Meany when John was blasting Meany and punching him because all those guys have been drinking up in the balcony. And that was something where I was like, everybody knows the fans know, and the fans are very aggressive too. It's Hammerstein ballroom. So probably 10 seconds, all I could think of is, are the fans going to start hopping the guard and going after John? Are the WWEs going to fight, fight the fans? Are they going to turn to us and start fighting? So there was a potential of that. Probably the next one would be the, the fire incident with the chair yeah. that you talked about earlier. That was terrifying because fire is unpredictable. And I didn't even know if we had a fire extinguisher in the building. Jesus, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Did the fire marshal ever turn up to the ECW arena? Maybe to get paid. <laughs> allegedly allegedly <laughs> allegedly um do you know because uh so people know sometimes if uh, the uh guest asks i'll run through some of the questions and i asked can i ask about the bradshaw thing we're not going to talk about bradshaw and meanie because we know the story about that but the bwo turns up uh soon afterwards and then uh there's like a rematch happening so i right my memory's really bad was it meanie and bradshaw or was it you and bradshaw in the match no, me, me and Bradshaw. It was very, uh, a very tense situation. Like, not I wasn't in the room with them two. I wasn't in the room with Vince. Nova and I were very separated from that. But the fact that it was happening at all could have been so many different things. So you you just don't know. It's like it's kind of live to tape anyway. It wasn't live SmackDown, but it was Tuesday taping. Uh, but deep down, I said, like, if we get through this or whatever happens, because I didn't even know the finish for a while, or, like who was going over or anything. I was saying, if anything happened, if we get through this and it's cordial or civil, it's literally just to avoid the lawsuit that many potentially obviously had mm. off of what, because you had video footage of them getting drunk. You had the fight. You had everything, the dangerous work environment, all that stuff that could have been brought to court. Did anybody, uh, and now I'm paraphrasing about 15 different people asking more or less the same question here, uh, but did anybody put you, uh, put their arm around you and say, listen, kid, you really lay that chair shot in this time? No, as a matter of fact, uh, when I came back in Gorilla, it was a ghost town. Vince wasn't even there. <laughs> really? No, it was a very much a, and I have to say this, this is where, in, in a way, I know it lives in urban legend and, you know, it's, a, it's some kind of myth that people talk about because obviously the story of it is obviously wow Bradshaw did this thing and then the karma came back or the receipt or you know Stevie was defending Meanie which by the way if at the time if I could have if I could have interpreted even what was happening at the time at one night stand Al Snow was already kind of heading that direction we would have got John away from Meanie before anything even happened but but who's doing it's it's a work sense. So when you're in a work situation and it turns into a shoot, there's a little bit of a, a shock involved. Like, well, what's what's you, you almost can't believe it's happening. So with the chair shot, I'll just preface it with this. I take no pride in ever or or solace or satisfaction in ever hurting anybody. It's not what we do. And even if it's what one of us do, and John has a reputation for being rough with people in the ring. He's been rough with me plenty of times. It's still not an excuse 
for any kind of unprofessional behavior to hurt anybody and do that level of damage. So, you know, and there was a thing where I had mentioned to John before the match, could you be on your knees or somewhere in a position where I can hit you with the seed? Because he, dude, he's a big, he's a monster. Yeah, six, six or something. Six, legit. six, 300 pounds. I mean, he's, he's bigger than Hogan in some ways. He's a big dude. So I was afraid when I hit him with the chair that I was going to hit him exactly where I was going to hit him with the part of the chair that he got hit with. And he was super cool. And he goes, no, 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 just lay it in. It's cool. I'll be, I'll be fine. I'll lean into it or whatever. And that's what happened. When I get back into Gorilla, it's a ghost town until one person shows up. The Undertaker. <laughs> it's me and Taker and Gorilla with nobody there. And I'm convinced Taker told everybody to leave. Came in. And at that point in my in my in my mind, it's like, do I keep my mouth shut and wait for him to talk to me? Do I explain myself? You're really in a part where you don't. And Taker's not easy to read. He's about as stoic and stone faced, no matter what the situation is. Happy Taker is upset Taker is sad <laughs> Taker, right? So, so, in this case, is, is am I dealing with shoot fighter Taker? Is he taping his wrist up like he did with the Austin Michaels thing? <laughs> or I'm looking for it all, James. So he comes up to me, and. He goes, hey, he goes, let me talk to you for a second. His demeanor wasn't intimidating, but he was like, hey, our roster is really thin right now. We can't afford to lose anybody. What you just did there, we were, we're probably going to be down a guy. And I go, take her. I swear to God, I did not do it purposely. I didn't do it. I'm waiting back here to see if he's okay. So if he comes back here and punches me or does whatever, I'm standing right here. I'm not, I'm not running from it. He goes, I understand. He goes, he, I, he goes, you didn't mean to do it, but we just need to be more careful. We can't afford to lose anybody. I go, I promise it'll never happen again. That was the end of it. John came back smiling. He goes, Hey man, you got me, you know? <laughs> and I was like, dude, I'm so, I'm so sorry. And he was just like, no, nah, it's cool. It's cool. And he goes, as a matter of fact, I want you to go to the magazine and tell him you you did it as a shoot. You gave me a receipt. Really? I want you to, I want to make this into something. So I go there, he's there. I'm telling the magazine, I go, is that cool? He goes, no, fucking harder, harder. I was like, <laughs> I was like well, okay. And, you know, he goes, go harder. He goes, I was, you know, I did what I did the meaning. And he was, he was very much business about it. Hmm. Now here's the funny, not so funny conclusion of the story. We do it. It gets published on the website, I think on the magazine, but definitely the website publishes it. And the next week I come to TV and John pulls me aside and he goes, Hey man, about that thing, like that interview you did, I go, did you change your mind? Are you mad at me now? And he goes, no. And he goes, but we never told Taker. And he called me during the week. Oh no. <laughs> and he said, is there something you want to tell me about an article on the internet? So now Taker is ready to like, after I said like, Hey, I'm not, it, I didn't do it on purpose. Now I'm doing an interview where I said do it on purpose. His buddy didn't clue him into it. And he's ready to confront me again at TV. So <laughs> the hand taping, this was going to be the hand taping, what it sounded like. With I would just like stick your fist out. And I would just run into it and take a bump. <laughs> I love I love how I mean John not to speak for John but he couldn't have come back and just got really annoyed about it. He, 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 I'm I'm happy he just came back to oh no no worries and sort of just accepted it. But um it this is just, be, yeah, we're all, we're all crazy. I mean yeah. that's just the way it is, you know. With the BWO it's sort of like a very mini like reunion on WWE TV. Was this always going to be a one-shot deal or I mean anything you know nothing's for certain in wrestling but we always told no it's one week thing and then you'll just go back to whatever you're doing after. They didn't say that, but we thought like there was somebody in legal I, I was convinced of that was like, they were like, how can we get out of this? And he was like, sign me to a contract or bring back the BWO. And me was gone maybe two, three months later. So he basically, we had that match and then we had the Mexico thing at Great American Bash. And then we were done. Nova and I knew right from the get go, mm. this was a lawsuit push to prevent any kind of, because how can you say when, if anything now, John could turn around and sue me for a dangerous work environment. <laughs> so now, like, everything looks square. And, yeah, Nova and I knew, and Nova was doing his best work as Simon Dean 
So he didn't want to go back to the BWO. And I was just like, I was like, whatever at the time, that's fine. But we weren't stupid. We knew what it was. Um, we're going to move on to some of the other questions. As much as I, I really thoroughly enjoyed the answer as well, uh, because I just want to talk about it more, but, it's, but it was a great answer. Clumsiest wrestler you ever wrestled? Clumsiest? Yeah, clumsiest. Uh, Heidenreich. <laughs> That's a name we don't get very often. Uh, la, 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 la. Funniest sign? He only, he only killed me for four weeks. He never got to touch anybody. Well, he got to touch Michael Cole in the back a little bit, literally. Yeah, well, yeah, that was the kind of, I mean, to talk about lawsuits. That was the kind of grievous touching that shouldn't be on TV. That was like the that was like the Vince McMahon like don't give an F days of stuff. You know? <laughs> Even yeah. I was like, oh god, man, I'm so glad I'm not on TV now. <laughs> <laughs> what if Michael Cole was like signed an NDA for that? Uh, f- the funniest sign you ever saw in the crowd. Oh my god, I can't remember. It's been so long. Well, in ECW, that the, the Steve F sheep thing, and then they repaired beach balling a sheep across the arena. <laughs> I just started saying in the beginning of my heel thing, when I wasn't quite a heel and wasn't pushed, the fans just made up chants and it was Steve F sheep, Steve F sheep. And they actually would have sheep that they would throw a uh, blow up sheep in the ring while I wrestled. That was kind of like the funniest thing, at least personally. Uh, with ECW, uh, I had to, yeah, what's the weirdest weapon that someone handed you from the crowd? Because you were there at the beginning days when they actually, you know, would bring their own weapons. What's the weirdest one? They would never hand me anything because I was a heel. I oh, get yeah. hit. Probably the strangest thing was uh, a Nintendo, and the second strangest and the hardcore thing was when John was bringing the big ass horns out and the saddle, and he was gonna he tied me up like a like a calf and everything in the rain. It was kind of cool. <laughs> but man, we, I, I took the fallaway slam. It was, it didn't look close, but it was close enough to where I, I was like, wow, I almost landed on the horns. Oof, geez, uh, that geez. wasn't fun. Jeez. Uh, what else am I going to ask you? The most memorable thing that you saw happen on an airplane? I was on the plane right from hell. I didn't even consider that answer uh any particular stories that you because we've heard so many there's been a dark side of the ring but any that you saw personally i i was right there at the uh exit row when um brock and kurt were banging against the uh door <laughs> i was right there um i earlier in that tour i heard vince trying to shoot on kurt in first class um i was there for the uh you know the serenading from, from gold dust to terry we were up for that um, but I wasn't there for any of the, or I did not witness any of the, the main part of the plane ride from hell. I didn't witness that because that would have been, that would have crossed a Rubicon that I couldn't witness that without stopping it. If you know what I mean, the, the accused assault or harassment, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have let that even with my stage or my status in the company, it, it just goes beyond like keeping your mouth shut for, for wrestling that goes beyond it. Was that I the, didn't witness that, thank God. Was that the worst flight you were ever on? No, it wasn't because they, they, you know it was just it was just like things going on, but you know turbulence and I'm a, oh. I'm afraid to fly. So to me, those are character. Yeah, I'm terrified to fly. I was going to say you really picked the wrong sort of like vocation. I, yeah, I, yeah I, I'm afraid of a lot of large crowds too. So there you go. <laughs> I'm really but I, uh, it was, you know, why it was the worst flight in a way. Because I knew I was so appreciative that they took care of us on the flight with travel accommodations, charters. It was so nice. And I knew it was coming to an end. I knew it was over after that flight. That's why it was very much a a terrible flight to me because it's almost like you couldn't enjoy it because you knew you were going back to coach and all that stuff and group flights like that. It was good. The boys ruined everything. (laughs) <laughs> I know um, I, I know this isn't for the Dutch podcast, but uh, we've done a video quite recently on the original plane ride from hell, which was in like 95, 96. And the entire, the entire, uh, uh, this is one where Savio Vega shaved, was it Ray, cut Razor Ramon's ponytail, and a load of other things happened on it. And then whatever flight carrier just said, we are not taking you to Germany. They dropped him off in England. I just said, you're going to have to find your own way. We will not carry you anymore. So that was the original one where the boys just ruined it. Wow, they were, at least we were coming home. 
<laughs> you know, at least I could hop in a rental car or go to TV or whatever. Wow, uh, that's crazy. Uh, I'll ask you a couple more, and then I'm going to go for a couple more subjects, and then I'll thank you for your time because I know you've got an appointment. Uh, best? Uh, no, I'm going to leave that one. Uh, most talented wrestler you ever worked with? Hey, thankfully, that's a tough one. There's a lot of talented people. There's a lot. Of, that's part of the reason why I want to do this too, because I really want to demonstrate the nuances of ring positioning, fundamentals, even ergonomics, and then psychology. Of course, uh, there's so many like talented workers. Uh, I, I tend to think guys like Val Venus and Kane and guys that are big jack guys, but are super light and can move. Those guys are really good. I would say even uh, to a degree, you look at Balls Mahoney, that they're talented because the look of a Balls Mahoney, he shouldn't be able to do what he's able to do. Raven's super talented because his psychology will allow him to show 100% of his strengths and hide almost 0% unless he chooses to show his weakness. There's, there's so many guys. Terry Taylor was a talented worker to some extent when I seen him in breakups. Even, you know, we still talk about, the boys talk about when Terry took a punch in TNA from Dreamer, the way he sold it was so realistic and everybody else was doing their little, like, egg. Yeah, as Kevin Nash says, egg beaters. Kevin Nash, I've been in the ring with Kevin Nash, a guy that could literally swallow me up and kill me if he wanted to and was like just touch just light mm. those are the guys i consider to be very very talented workers outside of the norm of what what you would think i think the people that have every reason to be clumsy and trip over their own feet and hurt people when those guys are even smoother than guys my size that's that's talent i'm going to ask you one more from this list it's always the one i end with right. the most Take your time i pushed my appointment back for oh. you uh how much time like okay, maybe another 15 minutes after now all right then okay i'll give you two more out of this and then i will ask so much more that i can fit in Sorry um, about that. Uh, uh, loudest spot caller loudest spot yeah. caller the only loud spot i ever heard was when taker yelled at chronic to feed during that infamous match that S i say for you. save that story save that story that's definitely coming uh most memorable backstage fight probably the scariest that I've seen. I've seen a few here and there that most involve New Jack, but <laughs> New Jack and Dances with Dudley at Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, where the locker room hung by a thread really, literally off a cliff, and they were rolling around and bouncing and taking bumps where we could have went off the side of the mountain. The building was on top of the mountain. Right. The dressing room was on stilts that connected diagonally oh. into the mountain. And that's when New Jack went at it with Dances with Dudley. The next one that was scary was at the Orlando Armory was New Jack and Balls, Mahoney. And New Jack had that big sickle. And he was coming at Balls with a sickle. Put the sickle down and started pounding him, but then went to pick the sickle back up again. And it, it could have got bad. Jesus. What were he, I mean, I'm going to ask, what were they about? Or was it just New Jack just felt like having a fight that day? I never asked because if you asked, you might get into a fight. <laughs> so, you know, but, but nobody knew. And all I remember was balls was getting hit so hard in the face, the back, the head, and was having a normal conversation with, with new Jack. New Jack was slamming him, punching him in the back of the head. He's like, Jack, what did I do? Jack, stop Jack. Like as if nothing was going on and he was, I mean, just cold cocking him in the temple, the jaw, the back of the head. And we he was talking like we're talking now. I've spoke to Johnny Candido quite quite a number of times, and he's always talking about how just one, how sort of lovely Balls Mahoney was, how quick to sort of like anger and then he just like turn off again, like like a child almost. But just like just genuinely how tough that dude was. And it, it, it sounds like that's another uh, sort of testament to man even new jack beating and he wouldn't like raise his voice no new they do, lots of guys in the business are tough guys you know what i mean and, and like i said earlier that's why i had to go the opposite way because i'm not one of those guys at least presented on tv right and now i'm gonna delve into what questions i can ask you next i can even give you the ones that i'm not going to ask you so uh did you have your nose broken in the first match of your wwf career is that true no 
No, I don't think I did. Okay, that was a bad question someone sent in. Sorry, Nigel, that was uh, a different story. I've had it broken lots of other times. (laughs) Not my opening match. Something I love. I asked Meanie this as well. The Blonde Bitch Project. Talk about... uh, Okay, in fact, just tell people what it was, because I don't think many people really remember it. So from beginning to end, the whole story of the vignettes and where they were going to lead before they were taken off TV. This, this actually leads into Vince being out of touch with a lot of things and maybe the problems you and Dutch talk about a lot too. The Blind Bitch Project was obviously a parody of the Blair Witch Project, which was the most popular. People didn't know if it was a, even a movie at the time. They thought it might have been a documentary. It was that that much of a, a good marketing push behind the movie. I can, say, I can say from my experience, so I was 12 at the time and I couldn't make head nor tail of it. I actually thought it was a documentary. So they did do, like for a 12-year-old me, they did a great job. Yeah, so we knew it was a hot button thing and it wasn't exposed yet. So Vince Russo, Ed Farrar wanted us to do the Blonde Bitch Project. And also Sable was suing the company, I believe. So anybody who has any kind of heat with the company, they're all for being petty and making fun of them. So we went to many, we went to Ed Farrar's house in his basement and a bunch of other places, filmed parodies of us with the camcorders and all that stuff. And then I was in the sable outfit in the corner with my head in the corner <laughs> with the blind wig. And that was the blind bitch project. Russo and Ed bought it, brought it to Vince McMahon and he had no idea what it was. And he goes, and they go, they try to explain the movie. This is what the movie is and what people think. And he goes, nobody's ever going to watch that. He goes, I wouldn't watch that. So They ended up scrapping it because of the lawsuit. That was the reason given, I guess, publicly. But privately, Vince just didn't get it. (laughs) That was 1999. He was out of touch, Vince, when it came to that. What was the uh, sort of punchline, if it were to have aired in its entirety? Me doing the sable line with my back to the mini going, Stevie, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I did the, all the ladies came to, be or all the ladies want to be me and all the guys came to see it like in that robotic promo voice yeah that was it and then when i turned around the camera like did the thing like at the end of the player which project <laughs> uh I, I asked this meanie he could remember it uh do you remember i think it was meanie playing wwf in your house which in that time was a really lame game like it was like four four years out of date do you remember the character he was playing as in the game in the vignette I don't, but I remember we did the, the video and it was part of the our vignettes too for when we were teaming up. I, I don't remember who he played as. It was Ahmed Johnson, which was just the greatest Oh, pick. he did the Ahmed Johnson uh, imitation too. <laughs> did he? As he was beating somebody up. <laughs> and then, he did the, you were starting to annoy me line. That's what Meany had done to make fun of him. <laughs> I, I can't remember. This is so long since I watched the first one as well. I'm sure. Was it you off camera just going, you're a loser as well? I was like, so That's 90s. Yeah. yeah. Man, I, I'm going to move on because I, I, it's one of those things where I just like to sit down and watch the entire thing with you and just like pick it. Anyway, forget it. Curtis Adams. I've never heard this one before either. Uh, Uncle Dave Meltzer wrote at one point that you were being considered for a place in Degeneration X. I believe the same week Jericho's debut occurred in the summer slam, uh, sorry, in the summertime Millennium Countdown 1999. Was this ever a consideration? And if so, what were the initial discussions like? It was a consideration right before I signed with the company. I had met with Vince. And by the way, absolutely, totally unprepared for what sat across for me with Vince. And there was no preparation. Like I said, I was very immature in a lot of ways. But I think Vince also knew that I was going to try to work hard I just, you just don't know sometimes with Vince when he wakes up in the morning. I'm sure Dutch said that what you're getting with Vince, if he's going to yell, if he's going to be happy, he's going to like it, not like it. And that was that was on the table. He was talking about possibly making me part of DJ DX, but I would be the guy who would bump and take finishes, I think, which was totally fine with me. Later on, I was actually early, early in the process considered to be an evolution too. Because I wanted young guys that could be, they considered myself, they considered Jindrak, who was best friends with Randy Orton at the time. And I think that's why he didn't get it, because they were they were out doing things and partying. I don't know what was going on, but Jindrak was, I thought it would have been a good choice. And it ended up being them. I think I was like one of the first guys 
they thought and that beat them up role that did jobs for the group or whatever, mm. which by the way, I'm still in evolution or DX. It wouldn't have been, <laughs> wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world, right? No, definitely not. So I know you just said more or less what you, it's, I mean, the way you described it, it was Virgil, but I can't imagine you would have been the Virgil of DX, but uh, is how was it presented to you? Just be a part of this. And, and then I was just like, okay, I would love to learn from the guys and, whatever you guys need. I didn't give too much feedback on what, what I should do or not do or what I, what I thought I should do. Mm. But I think I would have been more than a Virgil thing. If anything, I would have been the, the, the asshole that to- opens his mouth and ends up getting them in trouble. And I got to get beat up for it. I think I'd be a little bit more than just standing there doing nothing. No, I'd hope so as well. So what was like the Sean Waltman in NWO? Cause he was sort of like the guy who was almost, you know, he was the guy that you could be, but he was like a full member and, fully part of the and gang, he was the most that kind annoying of member he actually got yeah. over being, being annoying and over the top and i did see that as a as a maybe a blueprint to follow when they first said that we'd like to be, for you to maybe be in this yeah uh, permit me i've got to just quote this it's one of the best rick flair promos ever and he's with sean waltman and sean and he says so it's a uh this is rick flair saying it's sean waltman and he says Six, you're a fly in the ointment, and later on tonight, I'm going to kick your flyweight ass. I love that line. <laughs> Just a great line. Um, so this would have been bad guy heel degeneration X at this time if it was like later 1999. Well, in 99, I think they were just coming around to possibly possibly being baby faces because they started that during the, atti- the attitude era and all that stuff started around 96, 97, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, 97. So Triple H left and joined the corporation at WrestleMania 15, which was april or late march 1999 so this was sort of like the uh, the the in-between portion of dx where there was only like road dog and x-pack so i don't know if you had like thought to join at that point or when triple h re you know, and stephanie mcmahon and that whole version of dx i don't know which uh era you would have joined your guess is as good as mine because i, I signed <laughs> the company in june of 99 and then debuted in chicago with meany uh when i debuted on a uh, sunday night heat hmm. And then we were at SummerSlam and we didn't do anything except local metal matches and stuff like that. And then we did the SummerSlam thing where we tried to attach a car, you know, battery charger to Pepper. Remember Pepper? <laughs> yes. dog? I do. Very well. I remember Pepper. Uh, oh, I had something else. Oh, also, uh, quick fun fact. You were on the very first episode of Jacked, if uh, that means anything to you. Yeah. I think you were teaming with Meanie. I was always destined for those shows. I, that's why I created Stevie Night Heat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to right to censor and this is probably the other thing that we got the most questions on so many first one's from me were you bummed to have to cut your hair yeah i think but i i was because it was just to me like right now i still have it so it kind of like something i always liked but i it was not a standout thing another shock thing that got me attention so cutting it wasn't so much of a big deal but Knowing that this might not be a long-term thing at the beginning of it was was the worry. And that's where I think one of the people I, I looked at one of the questions, they asked about Jacob Israel, who is actually the main writer for Right to Censor. Mm-hmm. And he's the one, along with me, turned it from a three-week political agenda push to becoming a cult. He was the one that really turned a, a dark corner on that. And that's why it became what it was. So I don't know who Jacob Israel is. So he was a writer with WWF at the time. He was a writer. WWE. He has, yeah. he has a YouTube channel as well under his name. So you can check that out. So uh, I'm going to go back a bit then. So quite a few months before Right to Censor comes out, it's a, it's a, is it the Parent Television Council with L. Mm-hmm. Brent Bozell. Now these guys start getting involved with WWF affairs when SmackDown comes out around the, what, August of 1999. So, so nearly a year before Right to Censor. And... You get to WWF around that same time. Do you, uh, as just talent, realize just how powerful this lobby group is? And do you see these changes having to be made within the WWF to sort of like placate these guys? No, no, I, I didn't even know what they were until Vince brought me in the office, said, Yeah, this is one of the few times he's talked to me, said, This is what we're going to do. I want you to do your homework. I want you to join this, join this group and see what they do. And that's your homework to do that. But when he said that, like I knew they were trying to take away advertisers. I knew the company was in, in a little bit of trouble trying to to navigate that, but I also knew that we needed to do something different to make it have more lasting power. And that's where Jacob came in and said, man, I could see 
so many battles of good and evil and trying to do this stuff. And he goes, and Jacob and I actually believe that the product needed to be for the sake of the talent needed to be kind of taken away a little bit because the guys were constantly hurt and, and doing the right to censor protected the health and well being of a lot of people without getting heat on the company for, for peeling back from that. When did you realize this was going to have legs beyond the three weeks? When, when Godfather, uh, when we got Godfather, I, I thought that was a big deal. And then Val, obviously, and now we got, now he can just reform anybody and turn them heel in the group. Uh, first time. And getting Ivory, getting a woman meant a lot too. Uh, do you know, I was going to say that she was great. Mm -hmm. Ivory was, uh, with all due respect, I, I have to say Ivory was the best thing about that group, man. She was so no, good I, as an interview. I, I saw a second stage of Right to Censor, and it was never done before in wrestling, if you think about it, to have a female leader of the group. I wanted her to be the leader after a while. Because how much he would be like people back then, would, who are you to tell me what to do, you bitch, and blah, blah. Yeah, it would have been a lot of heat. I was smart enough to know a business that after a certain time, I didn't want to jump the shark. And also I'm still part of the group. You give it a fresh coat of paint. Now we got another year that we can, we can milk this. Yeah. Now, now uh, just what I said there, it sounds terribly disrespectful of me to say, no, I, I, I do believe that between you and Ivory equally as two mouthpieces who were so, uh, did Vince know that you could talk? Uh, Someone probably had to tell him I could talk from ECW, hmm. but I, I don't know. But the, I don't take offense to it. I don't take it personally. Ivory I, I just think she was just, I just, I loved Ivory I, in that. I thought she was wonderful. And man, she was one of the best in WrestleMania 17. Everyone says the greatest WrestleMania of all time, or most people, or a lot of people do. And her and China, uh, that match, it wasn't about the match, but it was about the journey to it. I think that was one of the biggest selling points of the pay per view that people don't really give enough credit for. Oh, we had tons of heat. We gave her a spike pile driver and everything, China, and ripped up the Playboy. We had a whole entire rumble to mess mania for those two girls, the run that, that the group and her had. That was it. You're right. It shouldn't have been such a squash in my mind, but I can see why they did it after all the heat we got on her. Um, first time hearing back about WrestleMania 17. Oh. Much, much tells great stories. But this is a nice little story, and I feel bad for for the McMahons. You know, they had the big tower things where WrestleMania X7, the set yes. has... Yeah. Well, it was too high, so they had to cut off or take the bottom out. So you know, it, it took out, like, two letters out of WrestleMania and X7 out of the stage. So when they shot it, they had to shoot above it and crop it out because... They literally had to remove part of the set because it was too high in the dome. And I remember Shane being so bummed. He was like, ah, oh, this sucks. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I still say that's the greatest WrestleMania. I, lo I love that show from top to bottom. And it's not like one of those ones where, you know, they have to keep like filling it with like legends from the past to try and bump a pay per view buy rate. No, this was all people in the company in 2001. And just everyone was just knew their role and were great at it. I miss that attitude error because not because it was crash TV or any of that stuff is because it was so people seem to have a lateral push from each other. Mm. There's no hierarchy. Every, like you said, every angle, every week, sometimes X Pox will fight Steve Austin for the title. Sometimes X Pox would be, he'd be fighting Gangrel, And there was just such an interchange of talent across the board. I'll give you one. Kurt Angle and Bubba Ray Dudley, they had a really good title match on SmackDown. I remember that distinctly at the time, thinking it was great. Um, I've got more uh, uh, right to sense questions. When was the first time you were presented with the theme music, as music as it was? Weren't presented. We just went out there and they played it. There was no rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they wanted to play it until they had to play it. So you never had like a, a meeting with Jim Johnson or anything like that saying, how, what kind of tone would you I, like the alarm? Four beeps before the, I need that. No, 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 <laughs> Jim, geez, what are you doing? How long have you been doing this? Let me, give me that keyboard. Let me do it. <laughs> oh, this, this is a great question. I've got to ask. Dark Cavins says, my question is, when were you the leader of Right to Censor? Whose idea was it to wear white socks? I had no black socks. And I just wore my gym shop. Oh, so it's a total gym accident. Sock. Total accident, but Dutch will tell you, and I'm sure everybody else, that's when the best stuff happens. 
<laughs> with uh, did you have any uh, call or sway of who would join the group, or was it just like this guy's joining the group this week? Deal with it. No, I had no no say in anything that we did outside of they would give me something, then I would go to Jacob, and we would do what we would do to to make it make sense. Um, Godfather and Val v- Venus have both said, "Man, they hated the group. It's it's not." Because of you, or any, they, they hated having their characters stripped away from them. Even though Val Venus was uh, a bad guy, anyway, he'd sort of like left the porn star thing in in the back. But he hated wearing shirts because he apparently would sweat brutally. Did they, did either of those, or even Bob Buchanan, did they complain about the the characters? Or yeah, I mean, but I, I look at those two characters in, in in you know in what they were. I look more as the fact as baby faces. Both those guys made tons of money in merchandise. Action figures, video games, T-shirts, gold chains, whatever it is, towels. I, I don't know how much merch they had, but as a baby face turning into a heel where you have no merchandise, your money gets cut dramatically. So that's what I think, you know, and, and Val wearing the sheet, we're all white. Imagine how hard that is to keep clean. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you're washing your own gear on the road as well. Uh, this is one, this is very interesting. Sir Solid a Snake, in the age of modern cancel culture, do you believe that right to censor would have been even more over as heels today? And I'll add this, would they be baby faces today? Oh, I mean, that's a tough question. I mean, Ivory came out for the rumble, I heard, and I heard she got a pretty good reaction when the music hit. I didn't see it. She was in Which the last Royal it? Rumble. I did see it. I don't remember. Ivory, <laughs> Ivory came out. Oh, sensor Ivory, yeah. I watched it and I don't remember it. Okay, well, apparently, it's apparently, it's over now. It's it's, it's a baby. Did get, she did get a positive reaction, but I I don't know where it would fit today with cancel culture. Obviously, people think we won the PG era war, and that's that's good. Keeps my name out there to some degree. I've done. I did an indie show once where I wrestled Anthony Green, who was a great indie talent who was in NXT as a August Gray or something like that. Well, I came out as right to censor Stevie. I told everybody that, you know, there's children in the audience, all this stuff. And you got me to thank for the PG era that you're watching today. They started booing. <laughs> Anthony Green has a fanny pack, pulls out a Snickers, and he goes, you get a little sensory when you're when you're hungry. <laughs> I ate it, and I was like, what the hell am I wearing? What the hell am I doing? And I ran to the back, and I had my BWO stuff underneath. BWO music hits, I come out and then wrestle. It was a fun time. I will uh, ask one more question, or one mini series of questions and then i will uh, ask for the plugs and i will let you get to your appointment i i am sorry for taking so much time but so many questions uh returning as the manager of chronic for one wonderful week in 2001 uh how off uh, how long were you off tv previously because i remember you being gone for a while i was gone for a while um ended up starting to lose the weight i gained a great deal of weight when i put the white shirt and tie on so we went to HWA and then worked in OVW at the time in developmental and came back and lost the weight and uh, ended up dyeing my hair really black for real uh, with the chronic thing. Cause I assume they're, they're friends of takers. This is going to be a, a thing that's going to last for a bit and the invasion angle, all that stuff. Um, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't last very long. Um, but I remember that match, man, that was, that was pretty, Pretty rough, and I don't understand why. These guys knew each other, and, and they're big guys. They knew what they could do. Everybody was a good worker. Just one of those nights, man, was weird. Well, you say that. I mean, do you think maybe Taker, because he was responsible for bringing the Bryans in, do you think he had, I don't know, like the weight of expectation on his shoulders a bit as well because he was the one to vouch for them? I have no clue. I don't know if they just weren't in ring shape because obviously WCW closed – they weren't really working house shows to get in the ring shape. I don't know what they were doing. They looked fantastic, mm-hmm. but sometimes too, when you work and you got four guys that size all in the ring, even if they can work, it's much different than David and Goliath type thing where a little guy can bump around and keep the pace of the match very, very fast. So maybe that's what, what happened. I don't think the matches, this is just going off memory from 20 years ago for me, but I don't think the match is bad at all. Like for the first two thirds, and at some point something just happened. And you watching from the outside, do you remember what that was? Or I just hear a Taker yell "feed" like once or twice, which means that they aren't that the gear is not raising up on the comeback. Mm. 
And like I said, that could have been not being in ring shape or that is the quickest they can bump in feet because they're used to being in guy in the ring with guys my size and smaller. So you think about Chronic and even Wrath and Brian Clark, they've always been set up to to bounce around smaller guys. This type of match is usually, you know, I, I can't quite put a definition on it, but when we came back, it was like, I guess nobody had a, you know, Taker wasn't happy, Glenn wasn't happy, Brian and Brian weren't happy. JR wasn't happy. Vince wasn't happy, but never to the point where I thought when I went to, it was Cleveland, Ohio the next week. And I remember walking in the Cleveland, there's bathrooms kind of off to my left. There's a guardrail blocking off that from the fans. And JR stopped me and he goes, Hey, I want to let you know that we're releasing chronic. You guys are no longer in a gimmick together, but you're, you've lost the weight. You got yourself in shape. We're going to try to do something with you. So just be patient. And he walked away. There was, I, I know it would be terribly unfair, but with WWF at the time, who knows? You were never like guilty by association, were you, in that sense? Or anyone consider you guilty by association? Even, a, even well, well, at the end, too, we called an audible, and I got in the ring, and my, I backed up to Glenn, and I did the old reaching behind me, and, oh, my God, is he still behind me? Turn around. Bag off, take the choke slam, half decent, take a bump. I think that there might have saved my job in a way because I got in the ring and called that audible and they they were cool with it. That we kind of saved a little bit of the match with that, that at least I got beat up. <laughs> yeah, the um, way you, the way you're describing it, it almost sounds like the Undertaker Steve Austin thing, where I know there's like a big size disparity between them, but they both come at you all the time. And the matches were never as great as maybe expectations uh, led people to believe. So maybe it was something like that. I don't know. Uh, there's just a, there's a clashing of styles, but then there's the same exact style can clash too. Yeah, Stevie, I have thoroughly enjoyed interviewing you, and I, I do know you've got to go. But before you go, uh, furnish us with some plugs where we can find you because you're you're documenting your continuous recovery on your YouTube channel. You've got a fitness website. I want to hear all of that. And also, you've got a screen behind you that you want to talk about what you're going to be doing with it soon. Yeah, This is the weak part. I can bump and sell, but I can't plug my own stuff. So <laughs> I'm going to have you do, do that from now on, James. Uh, yeah, you can go to seeyourinterestfitness.com. You can see that there's not only video reviews up there, but also written blog reviews on fitness equipment, home, garage gym, stuff like I said. My mission statement, probably throughout my entire life now, that you know, recovering from the infection, is to help and serve others and just try to educate and try to bring some positive, productive content into every space that I'm a part of. So Stevie Richards Fitness does that. Also, if you're looking to start your fitness journey, I have the 12 and 16 week resistance band training programs, as well as follow along full workout videos. James, if you want, I can send you some stuff. Let me know your thoughts about that. But you go to the website, check that out. If you have any questions, you can always contact me, Stevie Richards Fitness at gmail.com. Also, according to that board back there, I'm going to start doing match breakdown and analysis because there's far too many people that don't appreciate the nuances, the detail, the effort. Like there's a lot of times, and I think in this day and age too, James, celebrities are picking up wrestling very quickly. It seems like it's easier than ever, but it's really not. Bad Bunny and Logan Paul have trained extensively at, at doing this. They're just kind of naturals in a way, but I'm hoping that content kind of helps people appreciate the danger. And like I said, the nuance, the detail, the ring positioning, the psychology, especially. And also maybe the talent gets helped out by this content because there's way too many talents. And I'm sure Dutch has said this, that work way too hard and not smart enough. And I'm hoping that content that I'm bringing uh, to YouTube as well as Patreon will definitely uh, help people. There's going to be a premium model. It's going to bring full match analysis. Also, I'm going to try to bring the opponents that I wrestled on to do a watch along and talk about how these matches went and what, you know, I'm going to make fun of myself. The only yeah. person I'm going to bury is Stevie Richards. So <laughs> Check it out now. Hopefully, your your viewers will enjoy the content. And when is the uh, wrestling analysis going to be coming out? By the end of this week, I'll have a preview up on Vince Russo's channel by the end of this week. Okay. And then we're going to be putting up a couple, a couple week, a couple spot, not the full match breakdown, a couple per week on Patreon, 
And then the full match analysis will be once a month. And then I'm even going to do some on-demand kind of request tiers for what people want to see. It sounds like, I don't know, did you ever do like any extensive wrestling training for other people? Or it almost sounds like, man, I really wish I'd got into like training more guys. No, I, I didn't. I did like a seminar thing a long time ago for part of a shoot interview type deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but training wrestlers is a whole different story. And wrestling schools don't tend to getting people that getting people to pay for wrestling school is the hard, hardest part about running a wrestling school. Yeah. <laughs> I you, thought about it. I, I, I feel like I have a great uh, like passion to teach and educate and also show people not to make the mistakes I made. And hopefully the content will kind of bring that across yeah bwo training school though that that'd get some people through the door surely i got a name for the show that i'm not gonna get i'll tell you off camera okay right, but i'm gonna debut it when i debut it for now thank you very much everybody for watching i always say like oh we'll see you next week but we'll see whenever the next one comes out for goodness sake hopefully it'll it's... keep in touch with me too we oh yeah of course it will whatever i mean if nothing else i want to do a, a part two a part three we want to do a lord of the ring style uh and anth- omnibus of these interviews <laughs> But yeah, absolutely, uh, and I'm sure we will. But for oh. now, I'm gonna, I'm, I will let you go. Uh, Bonsai, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Stevie. We'll catch you again next week or the week after, whenever. <laughs>